I need about four terabytes of storage per student for our data. Okay, and so if you look at cloud storage, you know, subscribing to this amount of data, it's quite expensive actually to keep keep that data around. Um, this is also another really interesting thing. So this is where we've been processing a lot of our data is actually up on Brown's cluster. And one of the reasons we've been doing that is they have staff support and Rhode Island F scores participated in that and I've had, a, had an account up there. And one of the things that they've been able to do is really help us with getting software installed and testing things. And so you can see right now, based on the, the total um, terabytes of the CPU, the cluster that Ying and Yang put together is actually bigger than this high-speed compute cluster at Brown. So we actually have better facilities here right now at URI than this, this very great facility up at Brown. But the biggest difference is, you know, you can't go to somebody that's brand new building a research program and say, hey, I want to test the software. There's no personnel to install it. So this is a real plug for a lot of what you've heard already is that the, the human element behind these types of computing are really mission critical. And so the Brown cluster runs really well because it's staffed and they, uh, you know, it's a phone call or an email to get software installed and, and tested across the parallel, parallel nodes. And this is just quick acknowledgments of people that have participated in that project, but that's all I think I have to do. Thank you, Bethany. And last but not least is um, uh, Dr. Gavino Pugioni, who is uh, from my department, Computer Science and Statistics, with a joint position in the College of the Environment and Life Sciences. And he's a statistician in our department. Thank you, John. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you a little bit of my uh, research. Um, as John mentioned, I'm a statistician and I happen to work with uh, uh, big data and intensive computational uh, methods. Um, why uh, I titled it uh, Modern Statistical Methods and HPC, not only big data. As a statistician, many times I actually have the opposite problem, the problem of having not enough data. However, with not enough data, sometimes you have to try to make sense of a very complex reality. And you might have information about reality that is coming from data and is coming from other sources as well. So how do we combine different sources of knowledge, different components that we need in order to give a unified answer? This is one of the motivations why most of my research is actually interdisciplinary because several problems do not have just one uh, route, just one source of information. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this today. Um, nowadays, um, statisticians do not work isolated. isolated and um, modern statistical methodologies are not anymore recipes from a cookbook, some tools that you would uh, apply on the basis of some uh, particular predefined requirements. Uh, a lot of the modern statistical um, method developing uh, is ad hoc, is specific to the application that you are working with, and it has to deal with um, a lot of work that has been conducted previously, both at the theoretical level and the, uh, at the research level. So there is a big effort in trying to build bridges between um, mathematical methodology that usually tries to give some general models that are uh, supposed to be valid in a variety of situations. And they usually describe a mechanistic uh, representation of uh, natural phenomena. Statistical methods by nature, instead take into account um, the variability that you observe in a specific data set, and you try to make sense of the uncertainty that is associated to observing a particular re realization of a data generating process that is not directly observed. Now you can understand that trying to combine different sources of knowledge, different complex uh, methodologies involves uh, a lot of computational effort. 
So the big, um, uh, the big link that connects uh, sometimes different worlds is actually uh, computer science, method uh, computer methods. And the uh, general framework that I work most of the times with is the framework of uh, Bayesian hierarchical models. Uh, Bayesian hierarchical models allow you to have uh, different sources of knowledge stacked into a unified and coherent framework. Um, the model is usually formulated according to what we know and can be synthesized in parametric or non-parametric forms where you have components that are observed and components that are unknown. Uh, sometimes these components can be very complicated, as I'm going to explain. Sometimes the knowledge, uh, in the Bayesian framework, the knowledge about the unknown parts of your model are modeled with the prior distribution. The prior distribution uh, summarizes your knowledge or your lack of knowledge about these unknown quantities. The prior distribution is then combined with the, um, the information that comes from the observations from the data in the form of a live data. After the observation of the data, the revised, the updated information regarding the parameters is, um, um, is summarized by the so-called posterior distribution. That is, what do we know more about these unknown quantities after we observe the data? Now, the posterior distribution can be, in, can be the prior distribution for a subsequent experiment and can be used, of course, also in a, um, in a predictive environment. So what are the advantage, advantages and challenges of uh, this type of uh, statistical methodology? Well, again, the combining different sources of knowledge without having to, uh, to model things separately, but giving a coherent framework is a big advantage. Another big advantage is that collaborative research is naturally uh, fostered and encouraged because um, you can have results that can be directly interpreted by several scientists. You do not have, for instance, to um, summarize your data just like the statisticians would do it, because the statistician can put into uh, can put it, uh, the um, your biological model or your environmental model in a statistical framework. So the interpretation of the results can be seen from different uh, from different sources. So the challenges the challenges is that. Uh, the more complex the model, the more computational power uh, is required. So uh, the computational power is not ref re referring uh, just to the complexity of the data or the amount of the data. Sometimes it's because the model in itself is, uh, is complex and needs um, a lot of computational effort. So high-performance computing can make some model features uh, feasible and reduce computing time and allow to manage larger data sets. Sometimes in the past, uh, in my research, I had to make some type of compromise. For instance, I had uh, big data in, uh, uh, in the temporal point of view, but it was too big to run. So instead of having a resolution of, let's say, uh, uh, 15 minutes, I had to combine them and use them at the hourly level. So um, I still learned something from it, but I was losing a lot of resolution in the process. Or perhaps I had to choose a, a simpler model formulation in order to make it work. Let me give you some examples. Um, my research uh, is, uh, is addressed both at the methodological level and at the applied level. I'm going to explain how some of the um, new methods can actually uh, be applied in different fields. And in this case, we have a typical example of what I was mentioning. Limited amount of data large amount of prior information, trying to retrieve a complex truth. Uh, we have here, um, th this is a multidimensional uh, density that is observed only in very few points. And is a density that evolves in space and in time. So here we are in the field of spatial temporal data, data that are observed at different locations and frequently in time. That's one of the big areas for, uh, for big data. And here we have some approximation methods that are uh, available in the literature. Uh, uh, this one is the independent Richler process, and this is uh, a dynamic version of it. And as you can see, they do not give satisfactory results. I proposed here, this is an, ex an example, I will not get too technical. 
This is the approach that I propose. Having a very small amount of points, we get much closer to understand a very complex reality. So this is a method that is uh, carefully developed from the statistical point of view. However, just to obtain this, um, this figure, it takes about an hour, and it's only 100 points. Just to give you an idea of how sometimes even small data can be incredibly complex uh, to model. However, this type of methodology helps uh, in uh, complex and real world application. Um, for instance, here I describe the spread of disease in wildlife. So here we have uh, three different maps. Um, is the state of New York, and we have the spread of uh, raccoon rabies. Raccoon rabies is, um, is a disease that is uh, observed in wildlife. However, the amount of information that you have is mostly re related to the space and the time, to the location and the place where the uh, rabid raccoon was observed. However, you do not observe all the rabid raccoons. You only observe the ones that are found and tested. So we have another case where the amount of uh, data is not necessarily huge. However, the process is so complex that you have to develop a model that can be predictive, not only from the temporal point of view, but also from the spatial point of view. 